Welcome to the Car King Sports and Variety Show. I am your host, the Catman, Brian Cataquit, a.k.a. the Car King. We are live on ABC's KMET 1490 AM.com, your number one spot right here for news and talk on the West Coast. And I thank everyone for tuning in this morning. On a telephone line is uh, one of the most influential guitarists in American heavy metal and blues music. He was co-founder of the metal band Virgin Steel and Jack Starr's Burning Star. I welcome to the program the legendary Jack Starr. Jack, Brian C., thanks for being here this morning. Hey, it's my pleasure, Brian, and I'm happy to be out and about and talking to you this morning from Florida. Very nice. Always an honor to uh, speak with an artist, Jack. And, you know, I figure uh, we could begin talking a little bit about your history in pro music. Um, reading on you and your history, your background, I did come to find out that the breakup of Vanilla Fudge and keyboardist Mark Stein, who was a member of that group, was a big influence in naming your first band. Is that a fact? Yes, that's, that is true. Uh, I was, um, I think I was about like 15 years old and, uh, I lived on Long Island and when the Vanilla Fudge broke up, uh, Mark, who I never met by the way, lived in the same town as I did. And he started a band called Cynthia Fever. And, uh, the band had a 15 year old guitar player and which was kind of unusual. You know, it was around the same time that Neil Schoen uh, from Journey was also 15 and getting discovered. And anyway, how that relates to me is that their guitar player, Ricky Ramirez, was like one of my best friends. I was I was the older guy. I was 16 and he was 15. And then uh, and Ricky was an incredible guitar player. And then one day he said, hey, man, I, I got signed to RCA Records. I'm doing an album with uh, this uh, keyboard player from the Vanilla Fudge, and uh, and that was pretty cool. And then I listened to the album, and they had a song called Cynthia Fever. And I said, oh, you know what? I've got my first rock band. I think I want to call my band Cynthia Fever, because it kind of reminded me of Alice Cooper. You know, the, there was no Alice Cooper and Alice Cooper. And I thought, well, you know, if there's no Alice Cooper and Alice Cooper, there'll be no Cynthia Fever and Cynthia Fever. And that was yeah, that. No, yeah, I find I found that interesting because you know I did communicate with Mark Stein, and he's going to be on the program in a couple of weeks. So I found that very interesting. Yeah, uh, you know he's definitely one of the greatest uh, talents uh, you know America has ever produced. You know, uh, I mean, without the Vanilla Fudge, really there would have been no Deep Purple. The whole you know concept, you know, Deep Purple, where they were doing covers. And then, and then, uh, you know, doing their own uh, uh, arrangements, like you know, a song like "Hush," you know, which was, I think, their first single. And then they would, they would kind of, you know, Deep Purple got that from Vanilla Fudge. So it was uh, their influence is really way more than people realize, you know. And, oh, no, um, no, no, no question. Know. Yeah, man. So I was, you know, I was a big fan. You know, I was young and. Um, they lived in the same town I did, and then um, I got actually friendly also with the drummer uh, from uh, Boomerang, uh, which was the name of you know of the band that Mark Stein created. And in fact, um, he taught me how to drive a car. Really? Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I, I have to say this, and I don't mean this at all as a bad, horrible joke, but. Unfortunately, Jimmy passed away in a in a race car accident at Watkins Glen, which in New York is a big speedway in upstate New York. And he was, first of all, he was an incredible guy, incredible drummer, and uh, he, you know, he kind of like befriended me. You know, I was younger than him, but um, he was just a great guy, you know. We're talking with the legendary Jack Starr, who's on the program. Now, um, Jack, um, how did a Jack Starr, early 1980s, co-found, you know, co-find a band who is considered today a legendary, influential, and beloved band, admired not only by Queensryche, but some band called Metallica? How did that happen? <laughs> well, you know, um, first of all, I have to say, you know, 
I only met two of the guys in Metallica, you know, once we did a, we did a festival in Europe and, you know, they have tents like in the uh, backstage area, the fence of the festival. So uh, the band that I was with Virgin Steel, um, well, we had a tent and they had a tent and they were, you know, they were about, they were, uh, you know, maybe a little bit higher on the bill than we were, but they weren't really very super well known at that time. It was, it was around 1984, and uh, anyway, uh, I believe it was Kirk and uh, Kirk Hammett and and Cliff Burton, who was the bass player that passed away, and they just stopped by our tent, and we were just shooting the breeze with them, you know, and um, um, I think it was Kirk who said, you know, hey, Jack, we really like the song on Virgin Steel 1, Children of the Storm, and I thought, you know, I thought nothing of it at the time, you know, because... You know, they were about at the same place, you know, we were, you know. And then, oh, God, a year later, they just blew past everybody and uh, became like the number one band in uh, actually one, one of the biggest bands in the world, you know, not just in metal, you know. So it was kind of cool. And then they put out that album, uh, Garage Days, where they were paying tribute, you know, to some of their influences. And I was hoping, hey, you know, you never know, maybe they'll uh, record that song that they liked a hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, just, uh, I just read about your history and I'm just going to, you know, sh sh shoot out some questions. I mean, from what I understand, you, you were always considered to be an artist inspired by making the music you love and believed in. Is that what you brought to the table with Virgin Steel? Yeah, it really, it really was, you know, and, and um, the thing is like, um, we weren't, we weren't really trying to be commercial at all. Uh, we had songs, you know, that had like elaborate time changes and that had um, kind of, you know, these kind of abstract melodies, you know, that are rooted in like, you know, harmonic minors and um, there were slow parts in the song and then there were fast parts. It was really the beginning of like a style of heavy metal that they call epic metal or power metal. And we were really one of the pioneers of that genre. Uh, so that's kind of uh, how a lot of people, you know, think of me, you know, because back then in 1981, uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of it. There was like uh, Virgin Steel, there was Man War, uh, a band called Riot. And uh, there was uh, not that many. And, and uh, so we were like kind of uh, considered, you know, the pioneers of, of that style of music. Yeah. And then, so you mentioned 81 and then by 82, um, you're on the uh, U.S. Metal Volume 2, the band, right? The band was selected to be on the label's compilation album. Yeah. Well, you know, I was just a guy on Long Island reading Guitar Player magazine like every month, you know, and kind of daydreaming that, oh, wouldn't it be cool if one day, you know, I put out an album, you know, like a lot of the people that I was seeing, you know, in that magazine. And I came across um, an article and it was by Mike Varney, who was one of the columnists uh, in Guitar Player at that time. And he basically had something to the effect of, you know, we're looking for America's, you know, best unsung, unknown guitar players that can really shred. And I was thinking, well, you know, well, hey, I'm unknown. Um, I think I, I think I'm pretty good. I'm going to send my uh, my uh, demo tape it was because it, it was to be included in an album that he was putting together. And uh, so I sent in the demo tape and I really didn't think that I had a shot at being in this because there were probably hundreds of guitar players, you know, all across the country who thought like I did that, you know, that they were good and deserved to be on this album. But about like uh, about a week and a half later, he gave me a call and he said, hi, you know, this is Mike Varney. You know, I'm the guy that writes that column and guitar player. And at first I thought it was one of my friends, you know, like putting me on, you know, <laughs> you know, so I'm going, okay. Okay, Ron, tell me the truth, you know. And then, and then he goes, and you know, and then he said, no, no, I'm I'm Mike Varney. We really like the demo that you sent in, and we're going to put you on this album. And that was really, you know, the whole thing that set into motion this 
40 year trajectory that I've been on. Yeah, amazing. So, and then in 1983, uh, I guess you decide to leave the band. What was the deal with, with differences between you and David DeFay? Well, the problem was really the fact that we were growing apart, you know, in musical directions. Um, I wanted the band to be more guitar driven. Uh, and Dave wanted to be more on the progressive keyboard driven side. And for whatever reason, we weren't able to really compromise. You know, I think, I think basically the problem was two alpha males getting together, and it just sometimes it just doesn't work. Do you feel there was a little jealousy there, like talent je jealousy? Um, well, you know, there might have been, but you know, the thing is, like uh, Dave, Dave DeFay is extremely talented. He he knows way more, way more about music than I ever will. I mean, he's a trained musician. I'm basically a guy that plays by ear. So I would hope that, you know, there wasn't, you know, that kind of thing going on. Uh, but regardless, um, it was all for the better. I ended up getting a, uh, a solo uh, album deal with uh, Passport, which was a big independent label in the uh, 80s. You know, they had a lot of really well-known artists, and and I was like psyched, you know, that I went from kind of like the cult metal to like a higher rung on the ladder. I mean, I woke up and you know, here I am. I'm on this label, and I go to have a meeting with the president of the label, and he says, "Oh, by the way, you know, we just signed um, Bill Wyman of the Rolling Stones," and I go, "Really?" I said, <laughs> and I was like, "Okay." So now I'm on a label, and Bill Wyman is one of my label mates. <laughs> and it turned out that he had um, done a solo album right around the time that my solo album came out, also on Passport. His album was called Willie and the Poor Boys. And, but it was just things like that, you know, that really kind of made me feel good, you know, because, you know, when you're a musician, you know, and you don't have a platinum album, you look for things that are, like, encouraging, you know, like, that or for uh, being on a you know guitar magazine or being in a british metal magazine you know whatever it is you know because it's not always about money it's it's about recognition you know you you want people uh, especially in in the media or, or just for your fans or whatever you know to tell you hey you know you're good and i think that um now, there was a book out, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And in the book, you know, the women are saying men want to be like they want to be, you know, told they're good. They want, they want, um, you know, they want encouragement, you know. And I think artists especially, you know, anybody that puts out an album, you know, you want that, that peer approval, you know. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, you're you're ahead of the game. Like like you mentioned, I mean, you're one of the pioneers of, of this genre of music. So you have that as a, you know, as a label when we mention your names. So that's, you know, that's pretty cool recognition there. Yeah, absolutely, you know. And and um so that was a good thing, you know, how that panned out and then I was able to keep on going um because I just wanted to play music and, uh, and, you know, and it's a hard, it's a hard road, you know, any, any time, you know, you try to make a living from music, it's going to be difficult. And, uh, but I kind of, I stuck to my guns and I'm still doing it. And it's a hundred years later and, <laughs> or it feels like a hundred years later. And, and I love it, you know, and, um, I don't want to stop. Yeah, and now 1984, um, as you mentioned, you, you did your solo career. You had an album out, Out of Darkness, featuring uh, Rhett Forrester of Riot. Uh, um, and, you know, so tragically how he died. I mean, how was working with Rhett Forrester? Well, that was really incredible. Um, for, you know, Rhett was really one of a kind. Uh, if you, like, ever see the movie, you know, Almost Famous, you know, they... They, uh, Cameron Crowe keeps referring to, to the main character or one of the main characters as the blonde god, you know, and um, 
Rhett was kind of like that. You know, the guy's like was like six foot two, you know, had a very imposing presence. And um, he was like, we were kind of like diametrically opposed, you know, as people, as as everything. But yet we just got along really good. We 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 just liked each other, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm you know, I'm I'm only like, I don't know, five foot six. I, I I don't think I'm especially great looking. You know, I'm okay, but but Red had that kind of you know uh, rock star presence, whatever you want to call it. You know, you know you walk into like a club with Red and you see you know women just gravitating towards him, looking at him. You know, and and um, and then when he opens his mouth to sing, you know, it's like it was like listening to like Dave Coverdale or Robert Plant. You know. And, um, but, you know, there, but like, like a lot of musicians, you know, sometimes, you know, there's, um, you know, there's like, uh, I don't know, personality flaws or whatever you want to call it. Rhett liked to drink quite a bit. And, uh, he sometimes, you know, that, that would put a, uh, a strain, you know, with other people, uh, that didn't really bother me, you know, uh, because, I don't know. I'm pretty like I'm pretty open-minded, you know. I accept people for who they are, you know. And uh, and Brett was cool with me, and you know, I was and I really respected the guy. I thought he was a phenomenal singer, and uh, I, awesome. you know, and proof phenomenal. of it, you know. Yeah, and you know, the the proof is still there, and it always will be there, uh, because you know what you do, you know, that's permanent, you know, like albums and so on. You know, they don't go away. You know, I had a, a manager on Long Island. He, uh, His name was Frank Cariola. And he owned, like, probably the biggest club on Long Island. It was called Sundance. Very big venue in the uh, 1980s. And anyway, he was he was my manager. He even, like, backed a band that I had with uh, the bass player of Foghat, Greg McGregor. You know, he would put us on salary, whether we were playing or not playing which is always a good thing, you know, when, you, when, you know, when you're married and you got a little kid, it's great to have a salary coming in, you know, and he did that for us. But anyway, I wanted, I mentioned him because he told me once, this was, this was after I did an instrumental album on his record label anyway. And I was like, Oh man, you know, this sucks, Frank. And I was kind of like complaining to him, like, uh, you know, why is it that, we put out our album on the same week that Steve Vai puts out his first album and we're with the same distribution company. And uh, of course they're, you know, they're really plugging his album and not ours. And he just told me words that I will always remember. He, he said, Jack, don't worry about it. But he said it with a Long Island accent. So it's like, uh, don't worry about it, man. <laughs> because music is not perishable. It's going to be there for always, and uh, and that was it. And, you know, and it's kind of words that that rang true. You know, because it's not just about the instant gratification. It's about the fact that it really is not perishable. You know, there's no shelf life to an album if it's good. Because here, you know, you just mentioned an album that's literally like 40 years old. You know. And really, who would have thought when, you know, you put out an album like in 1984 that anyone's even going to remember, you know, 40 years into the future, you know? Yeah, and we're still talking about it today. It's crazy. Unbelievable. So you must be excited. The band must be excited. Your new release. Now, I have, I'm reading here, is that going to be out July 15th, Souls of the Innocent? Yes, it's coming out on the 15th. And, um... The label that I signed with, uh, our band, you know, Burning Star, uh, they're called Global Rock Records. They are based in England. They're, the owner of the label, his name is Brian Adams, not to be wow. confused with the other Brian Adams. Um, and uh, our manager, we have a new manager, Giles Lavery, who's from Australia originally, and he lives in West Germany. And uh, so as you can see, you know, it's kind of like a, like a global thing. You know, we, we're not confined to, you know, just Florida or just America. So the album, you know, when they signed our, our band Burning Star, 
they did something that was kind of unusual as far as I'm concerned because most of our um most of our emphasis and the push from labels has always been directed at Europe. So this time I'm talking to you. I'm talking, you know, you're American, right? Yes. I'm American, you're American, and it's like, hey, this is so cool. This label, even though they're based in Europe, wants our band Burning Star to to uh, make some headway in America and to eventually start touring here and and um, hopefully make the same kind of buzz that we've been able to make in Europe. So that, to me, is just something phenomenal and, and so different for my career because really in the last 40 years you know of being a recording artist there's been very very little emphasis on uh you know on uh, trying to trying to get my music known in uh, in america and jack this is your your i mean the, your last album was what four four and a half years ago yes that's correct yeah now, for the you know, I have a, a a wide streaming audience listening to the program. Um, when this new release comes out, where can they purchase your new work? Well, they could go to the Global Rock Records website, or they can go to Spotify. It, it'll be on Spotify, and it's going to be on all the uh, digital you know download networks. But also, um, they're, they're they're about to sign a deal with a large distribution company here in America. So it's not going to be hard to find, you know, because that's always been like a problem a lot of times, you know, with with the lesser known, you know, heavy metal. It's just hard to find, you know. And uh, I used to joke around about it, you know, like, you know, to be like a Burning Star fan, you really have to work at it because, you know, you're going to walk into a record store. There's not going to be a cardboard cutout of our latest album, you know, like there would be, you know, for, uh, I don't know, you know, for Lady Gaga or somebody, you know, you, you know, that's easy to find. And then, and then let's say you go to the B section and you're looking for Burning Star, well, you're going to come, you know, across, you know, Boston, the Beatles, everything that starts with the letter B. Then you're going to go to the S section. You know, you're going to have the Stones, you're going to have, uh, you know, whatever, I don't know, Stevie Winwood or whoever is in the S section. And then and then you got to keep going because you're not, you might not find, you know, Jack Star's Burning Star in the B or in the S. Then you got to look in the import. So so there's there's work. It's like it's hard to be a fan of of, you know, of lesser known heavy metal bands. It, but if you put the work into it, the reward is that you're you're in on something that is not super well known, but that is is something good, you know, something that that you and and, and a, a smaller percentage of the rock fans are into. Now we want to change that, but for now, you know, it's kind of cool. Well, we'll, we'll keep plugging it here. Souls of the Innocent, uh, July fifteenth. Global Rock Records. And, you know, before I let you go, um, Jack, uh, there's an official video, and I encourage all my listeners to check this out on YouTube. The Sands of Time official video. I mean, yeah. your performance is epic. Oh, man, thanks. It's so nice to hear you say that. Yeah, and, and another video actually came out yesterday. Uh, the video that came out yesterday, which was also on YouTube, is called Demons Behind Me. And just a quick clarification, it's not about like monsters and ghouls and goblins. It's about the demons of alcoholism and drug abuse and sex addiction and gambling. It's about demons that people deal with in their everyday life. And we, uh, we have a really cool video about that. And we just really hope all your listeners will check it out, you know. Yeah, I mean, but I, I, going back to that Sands of Time official video, I mean, the way you, you're soloing, and I want to ask you a quick question about soloing. I mean, are, do you have your solos, when you're doing a solo or a riff or a uh, you know, lick, do you have that memorized or you just go with the flow? Do you have secrets in your back pocket? Like, like what do you do? I mean, your soloing is superb on that video. 
Well, actually, you know, I don't really write out or plan all my solos because uh, I don't read and write music, which uh, a lot of guys, you know, my age, you know, from my era, really don't, you know, like uh, people like Jimmy Page, you know, George Harrison, even Jeff Beck doesn't read or write music. And you would think that he would because he's so technical. Um, so, no, they're not planned out. Uh, but what happens is, you know, you do like a couple of takes, you know, sometimes you'll do three, four takes. Sometimes you'll do seven or eight takes till you nail one that you and your producers are happy with. And then you go with that solo, and then that becomes what becomes the permanent solo. And then you go back and you learn your own solo, if, you know, if it's, especially if it's a good one. And then you try to get it as close to the uh, recorded version as you can, because, you know, the fans want to hear, hear that solo when you play live. And so I find that to be really cool, and, and um, that's what I try to do. I try to backtrack learn my own solos and um like the one like in demons behind me i liked it so much i really went back and it actually took me a couple of days and i learned it same thing with the one in uh sands of time the one that you mentioned i had to go back and learn and figure out exactly what i did off the cuff and i just tell you a real quick story um jimmy page from led zeppelin with this was like maybe 10 years ago he was judging a contest of like young guitar players uh, that were playing, you know, the solo to Stairway to Heaven. And I guess the, the aim of the contest was to reward the best uh, rendition with a Gibson Les Paul guitar. And Jimmy Page was going to present it to, to the guitar player that, that excelled and really did a great job. And so anyway, it was a 17-year-old kid that Jimmy Page presented the Gibson Les Paul to and then he said, you know, by the way, this was as he was giving the Les Paul to the kid. He goes, by the way, you play this closer than I've ever played it live. And uh, <laughs> I thought that that was really very honest and, and humble to basically say, you know, hey, I don't really plan these solos. You know, I improvise them. And, uh, and, and it's like giving, you know, credit, you know, for someone to be able to learn something note for note. Do you follow what I'm saying, Like, Yeah, no, it's just fascinating stuff, but, you know, I have, like, 30 seconds, so, you know, maybe yeah. we could do it again. Listen, I, I, I wish you best of luck. Please come back. Fascinating stuff. Great job today. Okay, thank you so much, and thanks for having me on, and I just want to thank all your listeners for checking it out. Have a good one, brother. Take care, take care of yourself. Jack Starr is Burning Star preparing to hit the road to promote Souls of the Innocent. So be on the lookout. Until next week, happy collecting to all.